Hello everyone, welcome to session 7 of LTech 623. As always, I want to begin by congratulating you on your excellent work related to Critical Reflection 6. I highly enjoyed hearing about your ideas and looking at your storyboards. We've got everything from grilled cheese sandwiches to underwater hand signals, and I can't wait to see these ideas come to fruition. Now, I do want to speak to some of the concerns that were raised in your critical reflections. About half of the concerns raised were production related. And this was the sense that many of you are feeling a little uncertain or lost in terms of technical detail. You're thinking about things like lighting, camera angle and movement, and how to sync audio and video. So here are a few thoughts related to that. But one of the things I want to emphasize is how important it's going to be to shoot some test footage first so that you actually capture some footage, pause, take a look at it and see, is it at the quality you're expecting? You don't want to record a whole big long thing to come and find out that the lighting's not right or the audio quality's not where you want it to be. Secondly, I really want to encourage you to think about point of view and whether or not you're going to have single or multiple perspectives. Now, typically with a top-down video, you are going to just have one perspective. It's that top-down perspective, and everything's going to be recorded from a single point of view. It doesn't have to be that way, and many of you in your storyboards talked about the desire to try to highlight different aspects of the skills that you're trying to convey. And so you'll have to think about, can that be done later on in post-production just by zooming in? Or is it something that needs to be done during production when you're actually shooting? So think about that before you get started. And then finally, ask yourself the question, does the camera actually have to move? Keep in mind that in post-processing, if we're, sh we're shooting at a high resolution, you can always zoom in and create movement effects within the frame of the video editing software to give the illusion that the camera's moving, as opposed to actually having the camera move. Now, that said, there are good reasons to have the camera move, and we'll talk about some of the different ways cameras can move a little bit later in this presentation. Now, the other big area of concerns were pedagogical related, and this has to do with feeling unsure about being able to convey the information you want to convey, such as keeping the audience engaged, judging how detailed to be, and how to include tips and tricks related to the skill that is the focus of your video. Now, here are a couple of pointers related to those concerns. It's really important that you ensure that your script has a narrative arc. In other words, you want it to go from beginning, middle, and end. And that's going to help create this sense of engagement and that everything is complete and the user will walk away satisfied. Also, keep in mind there's a difference between live action shooting. Like, for example, if you're cooking something, are you actually cooking that thing and recording at the same time while you're explaining the steps? Or are you just going to shoot the video and then add the voiceover afterwards in post-production? Either way is fine. And as the producer of your video, you can choose which option you want to use. Also, keep in mind, you don't have to say everything. You can use on-screen text or pop-ups to supplement the information that you are showing with your hands and also saying verbally. So don't try to feel like you have to include all of the tips and tricks. You can add that information in at a later time. And then also remember the power of video is we can manipulate time and sequence later on to speed things up or slow them down to help ensure that the learners watching your video are able to focus on what it is you want them to focus on. So those are some things to be thinking about as we move into the production step. Now, let's talk a little bit about lighting. As you know, lighting in film is the deliberate manipulation of light and shadows for a specific communication purpose. And its purpose is twofold, to manipulate and articulate our perception of the environment. And number two, to establish an aesthetic context for our experiences, a framework that tells us how we should feel about a certain event. 
And as you can see here, this video is showing us the power of manipulating lighting. So this is one person standing perfectly still, and the only thing that's changing is the direction of the light. And as you can see, it has rather dramatic effects. Now, I'm sure many of you know already that the most standard way of lighting a subject is to use three-point lighting. And the idea here is that each of these lights provides some information to help light up the subject. So let's see how this works. So here's a screenshot showing an individual with just a key light shining on them. And you can see half of his face is actually in shadow. So the key light is coming from an angle and is just lighting the side of his face. So in order to eliminate that heavy shadow on the left side of his face, we have to add in the fill. And so here we're seeing key plus fill gives us more even lighting across the face. Now we can take that a step further and add in what we call a hair light or a top down light to really help separate the individual or the subject from the background. And you can see the lighting on his head as well as his shoulders. And we can even go further by lighting the background as shown here. This is what happens step by step as we add in these different sources of light. And of course, we can use three-point lighting in top-down scenarios. Here's a little clip from a YouTube file showing how this individual uses three-point lighting in a top-down studio setup. And number two, I would suggest you guys to use a very soft source of light coming from directly above your camera's frame. For this, I like to use a big LED light panel, which already has a good enough surface area, but to get an even softer source of light, I shine it through a big 5-in-1 diffuser to get this very soft kinda light. Uh, now, secondly, in order to fill in these shadows over here, I like to have my Godox SL60W shining through a softbox to fill in these shadow regions. Now, as of right now, the shot kinda looks very bland, so what I like to do is add a little small LED light over here with a different color temperature that gives me a very nice color contrast in the overall shot. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize is you might have to get a little bit creative here with your lighting. And so I want you to embrace the do-it-yourself mentality. You don't have to spend a lot of money to have a fancy light kit. Of course, if you can do that, by all means, but that's not the expectation. So one of the things that I found really useful are these utility lights from Home Depot. They're about $10 and you can put pretty much any watt bulb you want into those things and they come with this really handy clip and so you can clip them on a bookshelf or a tripod or or anything else and they pivot and turn and you can position the light wherever you want because we don't want the light to be too harsh what you're seeing here is i just put a little bit of wax paper over the front uh, to kind of diffuse the light and soften it so that I'm getting some more even lighting. Now, I can take that a bit further, and in fact, I've done this before, so this is some work that I've done in my office where I created a soft box. So what does that mean? Well, it's just a box that's designed to shine really soft, diffuse light onto a particular subject. Working with cardboard, I in a little bit of tape, I was able to create this. I lined it with aluminum foil. I stuck the utility lamp in there. And then ultimately, I took a $4 frosted shower curtain and put that over the front of it. And that's what I used for a do-it-yourself softbox to get really soft lighting. And actually, if you want to take these utility lights one step further, if you put them on a dimmer switch, you can really control the intensity of the lighting. And it works fantastic for getting really excellent lighting effects. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the things we need to consider when thinking about the camera and cinemagraphic techniques. So let's talk a little bit about camera placement. Now, obviously camera placement is, is a key decision in storytelling. It helps us determine what the audience sees and from what perspective they see it. And ideally, each shot requires placing the camera in the best position for viewing, 
the characters, the setting, or the action, if we're shooting a film, or of the details of your chalk and talk video that's attempting to teach something. So camera placement is going to be very important. Now, generally there are three main characteristics to consider when thinking about camera placement. The first characteristic is camera angle, and that determines whether the viewer's point of view is objective or subjective. And that's going to be an important consideration as you're creating your chalk and talk videos. Another characteristic is the shot type, and we're going to talk more about this in a minute, but that defines how much of the scene and the subject is going to be visible in a given shot. Do we get to see everything in the broader context, or are we focused in real tight on some particular detail? The shot type helps determine that. And the third characteristic is camera height, and that defines the height of the camera, and consequently, it influences the viewer's psychological relationship with the scene. Is the camera looking up at something, or is it looking down? Is the camera tilted? We'll look at some of these more concretely in a minute. So, as you know, there are many different types of shots. And typically, folks will talk about seven types of shot. And those go from the extreme long shot all the way down to an extreme close-up. Now, here's an example of an extreme long shot. And here we're seeing the subjects from a distance, the two people walking on the beach. But we also get to take in the context, the scene where this action is taking place. Here's an example of a long shot. It's not a little bit closer than the extreme long shot, but it shows the subject from top to bottom, and it tends to still be dominated by scenery, and this really often helps us set the scene in our understanding of where the character is in, in the setting of the movie. Here's an example of a full shot, and a full shot frames the character from head to toe, with the subject roughly filling the frame. And so here you can see this horse is obviously the subject, and the subject is taking up the entire height of the frame. Here the emphasis tends to be more on action and movement rather than on the emotions of the character. Now here's a medium long shot, and this is kind of the in-between, or a three-quarter shot. So you could kind of think about this as from the knees up. And again, we're starting to see some, some emotion here, uh, but we're also em emphasizing character action. Here's an example of a medium shot, and this shows part of the subject in more detail. For a person, a medium shot typically frames them from about the waist up. And this is one of the most common shots that we see in movies. It focuses on the character or characters in a scene while still giving us a little bit of information what's happening in the background. The next, of course, is the close-up, and this is where you're filling the screen with part of the subject. Typically, it's the person's head or face, or in our chalk and talk videos, it might be your hands, or at least your forearms. And when we're focused on a person's face, obviously emotions and reaction are a big part of what we want the viewer to be paying attention to. And then, of course, we can go even further with the extreme close-up. And the idea here is to emphasize some small area of detail that's important. In films, it's often the eyes or the lips. In our chalk and talk videos, you might be zooming in on a particularly intricate move that you're demonstrating with your hand or the end result. After you've made the move, how does the material you're manipulating change? And you want to give the viewer that intimacy with the end result. Now, we can also talk about camera angles, and as you might imagine, camera angle has a strong effect on the dramatic impact of the story. Camera angle can be more or less subjective or objective. A more subjective camera angle places the viewer into the scene versus a more objective angle, which just provides a general view of the scene. For our chalk and talk videos, we want to keep our camera fairly neutral and natural because we're trying to be objective about this, the, the process that we're showing. Camera height can add dramatic or psychological overtones. Um, oftentimes, eye-level camera angles are best for shooting general scenes that should be presented from a normal eye level. And camera angles are often chosen for aesthetic, technical, or psychological reasons. 
And you can imagine that high camera angles put the audience into an elevated or powerful position, whereas low camera angles create the opposite impression. So here are some examples. This is just an eye level. It's a shot taken with the camera at approximately eye level, resulting in a very neutral effect on the audience. We see what we would expect to see from our eyes. Here's an example of a high angle. The subject is photographed from above eye level. The camera is looking down, and this creates the feeling that the subject is vulnerable or frightened. That's the opposite of a low angle, where the subject is photographed from below. And this can have the effect of making the subject look powerful or heroic. Now, the so-called Dutch angle are just shots where you're rolling the horizontal axis of the camera. You're tilting it slightly. And the idea here is to show some disorientation or some uneasy psychological state. Another angle is over the shoulder. And the idea here, this is super popular, of course, in movies. And the idea here is you are looking over the shoulder of one subject, but the focus is on the other person who is either listening or speaking. And it tends to place more emphasis on the connection between the two speakers. And then, of course, the bird's eye view, a high angle shot that's taken from directly overhead. We're going to be emphasizing this a lot in our Chalk and Talk videos. Okay, what about camera movements? Well, there's all kinds of camera movements, and motion is the primary aspect that differentiates film from photography and painting. And there are different characteristics of camera movement, the style of the movement, the trajectory, the pacing, and the timing in relation to all the other action that's happening on the screen. Now, camera movements can contribute to the mood and feel of the narrative. And camera movements can enhance the scene and add a layer of meaning beyond the shots themselves. At the same time, it's important to recognize that camera movements can actually get in the way and hinder our understanding of what's happening in the scene. So you have to use camera movement very carefully. There's actually kind of seven main camera movements and then something called rack focus. So you can see them illustrated here pretty clearly. Dolly is moving the camera forward and backward, pedestal is up and down, the truck is left and right, panning is when you're rotating to the left and right, tilting is when you're moving the camera up and down, and then rolling is when you're actually changing the at horizontal axis of the camera itself. Here's a really good YouTube video showing some of the meaning behind camera movement. It's quite fascinating. And I did want to show you an example of rack focus, where the camera actually changes its focus, which feels like movement to the viewer. And here's a little example of rack focus. Okay, we're pretty much out of time for today, but I did want to leave you with a few production tips as we move into the production phase of our first video project. So production tip number one, be sure to set the size of your recording device to either 720p or 1080p. Also, you want to look, dig into the advanced settings of your camera and make sure you can turn on the grid. So this is a screenshot from Android a couple of years ago. And in Android, the, the rule of thirds grid is called the assisted grid. And so that's something you would want to turn on to help you frame your shots. Now, importantly, production tip number three is it's really important to square up the camera in top-down video shooting. So as you can see here, this person's camera is off kilter to the box that he or she is shooting. And so the rule of thirds, those grid lines can really help you manipulate the camera to make sure that it gets to parallel with the horizontal surface that you're shooting on. So be sure to, to shoot some test footage ahead of time to find that out. 
Now, production tip number four, spend a little bit of time thinking about an appropriate background and or surface because that's going to be part of the shot. It's not the focus of your video, of course, but it is going to be in every frame. So it's going to have an impact on the viewer. So think about whether or not your background should be neutral or textured or if you should have any decorations in there to try to fill out your frame a little bit. Those are some important considerations. And finally, I just want to encourage you to shoot lots of footage. We're going to edit and clean up everything next week in post-production. So the goal now is to just capture lots and lots of footage. We're going to clean it up in post-production in week eight. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.